going to pick up where we left off. This time we're in section 6.4. And remember, let's keep in mind the whole purpose of this. Um, I want you to envision electrons flying around the nucleus. Okay? And as they're flying around the nucleus, they're traveling as waves. They're making these wave patterns. And remember we were talking yesterday about a dog walker walking a Great Dane alongside a little Chihuahua. And as they're making those steps, imagine those being like these waves that we're talking about. So we're going to talk about some scientists now and some mathematicians that hypothesized what these patterns might look like. And the first of those is de Broglie. His name was the de Broglie hypothesis is what he came up with. And so this is what uh, he said. He says that the waves that were generated, if you think about a guitar, and I'm going to go to the next screen, can be thought about as standing or stationary ways. If you thought about it, when you pluck a string or even a rubber band, that wave just looks like it's just vibrating back and forth, standing still. That's called a standing wave because it doesn't uh, travel up and down the spring. If you took a slinky and you slung it, that wave is going to travel all the way down that slinky. But a guitar string... That wave looks like it's just standing in place, vibrating. That's a standing wave. That's what the difference is. And then some points on the string, again, if you think about it, it's, there's a picture on the next page and there's a picture in your text, but there's picture uh, points on there where there's no amplitude, where it's, those are called nodes. Those are the nodes. And so <coughs> there could be one node, there could be more nodes. There's going to be a node at the end of the guitar string, and there could be other nodes along the way. Look at the picture on this next page where it's talking about. Here you have, this would be a node right here. Here's a node, here's a node here. Here you have one in the middle, and at the end, here you have two in the in the middle like this. These are all called nodes. Now, in a guitar string, if you were to put your finger right there, you would not hear any noise right there. Okay? So, and it's going to determine the pitch of your guitar. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch is going to be. Well, de Broglie says that an electron is sort of moves like a standing wave like this. That he makes, that electrons as they're moving around like this, that they travel in these waves and they make this wave type pattern. And Buddy said that they are only allowed to be in certain wavelengths, that they travel in these certain wavelengths they only have a certain amount of energy and so he gave this formula right here which you will not have to know that uh, to be able to say and this is why he hypothesized that an electron cannot spin itself into the nucleus of an atom and be annihilated okay so this is what his hypothesis led to okay so he said then, if the energy of an electron, let's say in a hydrogen atom, behaves like a standing wave, then we ought to be able to count it, quantize it. And so that's what led to this de Broglie uh, expression, where you have this lambda. This lambda should be familiar to you from the other day. And H, that's Planck's uh, constant right there, okay? And then <clears throat> M is the mass, and U, remember, stands for velocity. And so then you get um, down to this right here. A wavelength then can be calculated, any wavelength can be calculated using this de Broglie wavelength. 
right here. Okay, so you can calculate the wavelength of anything like this sample problem using that uh, formula. Here's a bullet, a 25 gram bullet that's traveling at 612 meters per second. So we know what Planck's constant is. That's not something you're going to have to know. It will be given to you. So you know what H, H is, and you know that mass is measured in kilograms, not grams. So the first step would be to change this grams right here to kilograms. So let's divide by 1,000 to change grams into kilograms. Just use some dimensional analysis, change grams to kilograms. All right? So also, let's look at one more thing. Planck's constant here is in joule seconds. All right? Since we're using meters per second and kilograms, let's change a joule. Remember that a joule is a kilogram meter per second squared, or a meter squared per second, I'm sorry. So make sure that you uh, know that, that a joule is the same thing as a kilogram meter squared per second, okay? So we can replace that J with this unit, that joule with that unit. When I was in London over spring break, I was able to see the grave of James Prescott Jewell and Isaac Newton and many other famous people. And so he's famous enough that he has um, a, a place forever laid to rest in Westminster Abbey. So he was a big deal, at least to the people, important people in England. All right, so let's use these numbers and let's calculate the wavelength of a bullet that's fired at 612 meters per second. So here's your formula where H is Planck's constant. This is the formula that we're going to use, find the wavelength of this. Okay, and <clears throat> here's Planck's constant. We're just plugging and chugging right here, and here is that 25 grams changed into kilograms and then there's your mass. Now please, please keep in mind that when you put this in your calculator, please be careful right here. When you're putting this in, make sure that you, first of all, when you, make sure that you go 6.63 E, use your second E, negative 34, then when you divide it by 0.025 and then since that 612 is also in the denominator, divide it by 612. Otherwise, you're going to get an incorrect answer. Another alternative would be to make sure that you would put that 0 .025 and 612 in its own set of parentheses if you're going to insist on multiplying, okay, so that you are going to end up with 4.3 times 10 to the negative 35 meter. Notice what a very short wavelength that is. That's because that bullet is moving, okay? As opposed to this um, other wavelength, notice this wavelength here is quite short, times 10 to the negative 5 meters, okay? Same procedure, there's Planck's constant, and there's your kilogram, this is an electron here, and there's its speed. Okay, this was an electron having that mass moving at 63 meters per second. So notice the difference there in the wavelengths. Okay, all right. And then this right here is just um, some experimental uh, evidence that indeed electrons do show wave-like properties. That would be in your text. And then we're going to get into what's called the uncertainty principle, the Schrodinger equation, and the modern uh, quantum mechanical 
description. All of this is actually leading up to the most important or meat of this particular chapter, electron configurations. All right, um, I'm just going to hit on the, this. You don't have to do the math on this. We're just going to talk about um, Werner Heisenberg. He was a German guy, and he basically said this, that you cannot know that electrons are moving much too fast and they're much too small for you to be able to know with certainty both the position and the speed or the momentum of an electron at any time. You can't know both at the same time. That's what he said. And stated mathematically, you have that uh, uncertainty principle that's given to you there. I will not ask you to know that. We are not going to do that mathematically at all. I just want you to know what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says in words, that it is impossible to know at the same time both the momentum and the position of an electron with certainty. Can't do it. They're just moving too fast. All right. And so here's uh, working out a problem with that. But again, I'm not going to ask you to do those. I want to spend our time instead um, of working with electron configurations. That leads us to Schrodinger. Erwin Schrodinger was a brilliant mathematician. And he came up um, with the modern interpretation of what electrons look like as they're orbiting an atom. Okay, and again, so much math, lots of hard calculus, so we're not going to go into all of that, but I do want you to know that it's a big deal. Okay, it is a really big deal. What's important to know here is that his equations um, you know what a sine wave or a cosine curve looks like. His equations took those even to an another limit that says we can predict what the shape of the path of an electron is going to take. And that may not sound like a big deal, but when these atoms are bonding, it's those outer energy electrons, those outer energy level electrons that are doing that bonding and how they orient themselves and how they interact with each other is what causes a, that bonding. So it really is a big deal. So this is what he said. The probability of finding an electron in this certain region of space is proportional to its wave function. So we can predict what that probability is, and not only can we predict what the probability of finding an electron in a certain region of space around an atom, in the, around the nucleus of an atom, but we can also predict what the shape is going to be based on uh, Schrodinger's equations. Okay, So that leads us to the quantum mechanical description of what a hydrogen atom looks like. Schrodinger equation gives us possible energy states that an electron can have. Not only does it give the possible energy states that an electron can have, it even gives the functions so that corresponds to the shape that those paths that the electron might take are going to look like. And we use numbers to represent the energy levels that those are going to be. So it's very, very complicated. And some people that can't think um, or can't visualize what things look like struggle with this. I am one of those people. So we have models that we can look at. Here's a picture of what Schrodinger's equation came up with. Okay, Here's what a hydrogen atom might look like. Because Schrodinger's model says that you have the electron density, which means that that electron for hydrogen, now the simplest atom is hydrogen with only one electron. It says you're going to have a region of very high electron density. That electron is going to spend most of its time 
orbiting for hydrogen close to that nucleus and its orbit is going to be spherical. Okay, and that's called, it's going to make an electron cloud. And he called these things where there's going to be a very high probability of finding an electron, this very dense electron cloud, orbitals. That's what they're called. So we got all of that history and all of that background just to talk about orbitals, atomic orbitals. So that's a very important word that you're going to hear a lot and you're going to need to know. I want you to know this word, atomic orbital. And an orbital is a cloud shape. It's a wave function that generates a shape. Okay, It's a mathematical function that can be used to generate the shape or a path where there's a very high probability that there's going to be an electron orbiting around an atom. That's what it is. Lots of math involved in predicting the path that an electron might take around the nucleus of an atom. So, you can see what she says here. An electron is in a certain orbital. We mean that that electron is very probably going to be there. There's a density cloud uh, so the, there's going to be a very high probability that there's an electron orbiting in that space around the nucleus. Okay, now please understand with me that orbitals are not like rooms in a house. That they exist even if no one's in them. Orbitals are regions of space around the nucleus that an electron might make as it flies around the nucleus because electrons are very negative and so they're moving so fast you can think of it as like um, Sonic the Hedgehog or Flash Gordon or Superman who's moving so fast that all you see is a smear or a cloud of negativity that's what you know the high-speed photography and you just see a cloud or a smear. That's what an electron is doing. It's moving so fast that it like makes this cloud. So orbitals are mathematically generated probability clouds that if an electron is moving in a particular place, there's going to be a high probability of finding them there. And I hope I did a good job of explaining that. I do much better when I can see you face to face and have my hands to demonstrate and I can have the board to write on and draw these orbitals for you because they come in different shapes because um, the electrons, they have different energy levels so they have make different shapes as they move. Okay, So these atomic orbitals, they have characteristic energy and so they make these different shapes. All right. So let's talk about how we can identify these orbitals. There are three quantum numbers that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the n, which is the principal quantum number, and all in the world it means is the energy level that it's in whatever energy level it's in. How far is it from the nucleus? Is it in the first, the closest energy level? That would be one. The second energy level out, that would be two, and so on. That's what that represents. That's all it is. Okay? And the second one is the spin that the electrons have. All right? And then you have very, very important the orbital designation. Now, I don't really understand why she has to be so complicated, but 
what this means by the orbital designation is the actual shape of the orbital and I'm going to talk to you at length about them. The shape of the orbital, the S stands for sphere shaped. This orbital designation actually means the because of its energy that it has, what shape does that electron make as it's flying through the air? Okay, based on all these very difficult mathematic uh, mathematical equations that Schrodinger came up with, he predicted the shape that that electron would make as it orbits the nucleus. Okay, they can they come in these four shapes: S shapes, P shapes. D shapes and F shapes. And instead of trying to draw the shapes, he just gave them designations S, P, D, and F. Now, S stands for, I think of it as being sphere shape. Okay, D, uh, P looks to me like a peanut or a dumbbell. Then D it looks like a four leaf clover. F looks like a daisy, a flower. And we're going to investigate those. And you're going to learn to uh, write them. Okay. I'm not going to talk to you about these just anymore. We're going to. Instead, we're going to talk about the rules for them. We're also going to talk to you about the rules for. Um, how these electrons can coexist in the same space. Because remember, electrons are negative. They don't like each other, and they really don't want to hang out together. So if they do occupy the same space, they're going to have opposite spins. And if they do, if they are in the same orbital, and they're oppositely spinned, then they're called paired. Okay? All right. So let's look at these. Right here, these are S orbitals. This is what they look like. This is just a cross section of an S orbital. This is what they look like. So imagine each energy level in an atom has an S orbital. So you have to think about a tennis ball, inside a volleyball, inside a beach ball, inside, you know, a much larger beach ball, and so on. So that's what you have. A ball inside a ball inside a ball inside these um, orbitals. And these, elect these are places where there's a very high probability where an electron is going to be orbiting. Please keep in mind that that's what this is. Where there's a high region of negative uh, charge where those electrons are spinning and orbiting. Each orbital can hold no more than two electrons. And each energy level has exactly one of these kind of orbitals, these S-shaped orbitals. So the first energy level has one and only one S-shaped orbital. So two electrons can live in that or make that shape. And the second energy level, it has also got an S-shaped orbital, the third energy level, and so on. Each principal energy level has an S-shaped orbital. All right, and then you have the p orbitals, okay? And the p orbitals, what this is, what she's saying in this slide right here, when you have the principal quantum number is two, in other words, in the second energy level and above, second energy level, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. Um, then you can start having p orbitals also. Electrons have enough energy now that according to the Schrodinger equation, they can make orbitals 
that are shaped like peanuts. They're when they're orbiting, they come fold back in on themselves and make this kind of shape, which I don't draw especially well. She probably has a picture on the next slide. Okay. Yes. See what that looks like. Each energy level, starting with the second energy level, has three of these shaped orbitals. Okay, please understand with me, two electrons can live in each of these orbitals. So two electrons can live in this orbital, two electrons can live in this orbital, and two electrons can live in this orbital. Now please mind you that it's not that one electron lives over here and one electron lives over here. That's not what happens. Please keep in mind what's going on here. What's going on here is that as these electrons are flying around, you see where the high density is. They are making this shape as they are flying through the air. So you see where the highest probability is, where the highest density is. So it's more like they're coming like so. And another thing to blow your mind some more is that in the midst of all these, you have, these are like hooked together in on themselves. Like, here's your one, and then here's the other. And then the third kind of comes out like this. So there's three dimensional. And somehow in this mess, you have an S orbital in the middle there. As a matter of fact, you have two. And how do those electrons that don't like each other roam around in through here? And how does an electron get from this lobe of this P to that lobe of that P? And not ever cross through that nucleus. Those are questions that I have for another time, okay? But those are your orbitals. Those are your P's. And lastly, that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the D shapes, okay? The D orbitals look like this. You have this picture in your text as well. This is what the D. And they start in the third energy level. They start with the third energy level, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. They have the D's. You see what they look like? They sort of look like four-leaf clovers, and then you have one that um, sort of looks like a P with a donut around it. All right? And then you have F's. The F orbitals, they only fill those two rows at the very bottom of your periodic table that you always wondered, why are they down there? Why aren't they up with the others? They fill your F-shaped orbitals. And they're mostly used, they're the, your radioactive guys. And so um, we're not going to worry so much about them, but they do exist, and they're shaped like seven-petaled daisies. So they have seven petals each, all right? Now, we are not um, going to concern ourselves with this problem right here. Um, it's more important to me that we learn how to write... Um, electron configurations and I I do want you to for sure know this energy of these orbitals I do want you to know that a 1s orbital has less energy than a 2s orbital and a 2s orbital has the same amount of energy as a 2p even though their orbitals are shaped different they both exist in the second energy level and they have the same amount of energy that a 2p has less than a 3s and so on I would expect you to know those things, okay? And this is the way we're going to learn how to write uh, electron configurations. And there is this chart that's going to be very helpful for you. But I think that I've put forth a lot of information, and a lot of it's very difficult to perceive. And so I'm going to quit for now.